everyone. Um, so I just wanted to start by thanking the IHR for having me um, and for everyone coming on to listen. Uh, so this is my first talk since beginning my PhD. Uh, so I'm looking forward to any feedback you have and any suggestions. Um, and most of my research uh, this year has been conducted through lockdown. Uh, uh, so this, pro this part, this project came from looking at the British newspaper uh, British newspaper archive um, and looking at articles from the introduction of the dining car. So on the 1st of November, oh, my presentation isn't turning. Oh, there we go. Uh, on the 1st of November, 1879, the Great Northern Railway were the first to introduce the dining car to Britain on their Leeds to London King's Cross service. The dining car was the creation of George Mortimer Pullman, the guy on the left, an American pioneer who from 1859 had invented methods to improve the comfort of rail travel. He began with sleeping cars and day saloons and consequently in 1868 he introduced his first dining car on the Chicago and Alton Railroad named Delmonico after the famous New York restaurant. When the dining car came across the Atlantic to England, it was praised in newspapers across Britain for the luxury, comfort and convenience it provided. And the illustration on, illustration on the right is from the graphic in 1879 of what it would have looked like. When the dining car um, came across, um, the luxury it provided included electric bells to summon the waiter, a bill of fare included in soups, fish, entrees, rust joints, puddings and fruits for dessert. However, it was also praised by contemporaries for solving many a traveller's rushed meal and their resulting dyspepsia. So today we're going to be talking about what was dyspepsia in the context of the railways, uh, how dyspepsia and the railways affected eating habits, uh, and how the introduction of the dining car and the response from Victorian commentators conveys the complex relationship they had with railway technology. So, Prior to the introduction of the dining car in 1879, there was no official on-train refreshment facilities on the railways. For passengers traveling particular, particularly on longer journeys, this provided the problem of when and what they were going to eat. There were a few options, so passengers could bring their own food. Uh, on, uh, after 1876, they could order luncheon baskets for their journey, such as the one in the top left. Um, I like to think of them as the equivalent of a Tesco meal deal, but a bit posher. Um, all passengers could sate their hunger with a trip to the refreshment room. According to Jack Simmons and Gordon Biddle, the first railway refreshment rooms were opened in the 1830s, selling food and drinks to passengers either at the beginning or the end of their journey, or when trains took meal stops. The refreshment rooms changed in size and style throughout the 19th century to meet growing demand, moving from pork pies, sandwiches and counter service to including full meals and dining rooms with table service. The standard of the food served at these facilities has had a long standing infamous reputation, a perhaps not warranted reputation, but a reputation all the same, uh, with Charles Dickens Mugby Junction solidifying this image. He depicts the rude customer service of the missus, the incompetence of Mrs. Sniff, who muddled up the cups of tea, to the stale pastry and the sawdust sandwiches under the glass covers. Alongside Dickens, members of the public made complaints about the repulsive dining facilities through one of the only widespread public, platform, pla uh, public platforms available to them, the letter to the editor. These letters varied from constructed feedback, uh, constructive feedback to improve uh, railway refreshment rooms, to gripes about the quality and price of the food, to hygiene and customer service. So for example, a writer identified as M who wrote to the Norfolk Chronicle in 1864, suggested that the refreshment room cook should become famous for one or two dishes, such as one soup, one cold meat or pie, and one made dish where quality, not quantity, must be the first regard. Whereas a Viator Infelix, when writing to the Times in 1872, wrote a more scathing review describing the horrors of the railway sandwich as enough to make one's flesh creep and doubted the cleanliness of both the tables and the waiters. These letters are significant because they suggest that travellers cared about what and how they were eating around the railways. However, railway patrons not only complained about the food, but utilised this platform to express their concerns about the effects eating on the railways had on their lives. The, 
the introduction of the dining car seemed to be an opportunity to share these concerns and especially to show their dislike towards the refreshment stop. Despite the negativity towards the railway sandwich, it did not rival the dislike of the meal stop. So these were scheduled breaks where passengers could alight from the train for refreshment. However, these stops were notoriously short. And the Railway Travellers Handbook on the left stated that these stops were between five and 10 minutes long uh, they advised travellers should bring their own provisions to avoid the disappointment of either not being served because there's too many people, or if they manage to acquire food, not having the time to eat it before the bell rang. They gave suggestions of what passengers should do if they did risk the refreshment stop, um, such as asking for um, making orders as short as possible. So, for example, rather than asking for a basin of soup, a customer should, should just say soup and they should always have the precise sum of money in hand. Um, it's a bit of an exaggeration. So there were some stops which were 10 minutes long, uh, most famous, I think, Swindon, uh, but other stops lasted up to 40 minutes. Regardless, many railway patrons felt the meal stops were too short. And with the introduction of the dining car, newspapers and contemporaries also took the opportunity to complain about them and the effects railway traveling had on eating habits. So, for example, the London Illustrated News stated that the irregular dining hours, beyond all doubt, have shortened the lives of many prosperous and active men of business who are little past mid, uh, middle age. Similarly, a letter written by an RWJ to the editor of the Times that was reprinted in newspapers across Britain, so from Portsmouth all the way up to, I think, Kilmarnock, um, argued that dining cars would be beneficial to those favourite trains, the Scotch Expresses with the benefits being comfort to the passengers and profit to the railway company and many a fit of dyspepsia being averted. Railway patrons were not just concerned with the quality of the food they were eating, but also with the quantity of time they had to consume it, fearing that it could cause dyspepsia and be, and be, dis, oh, and be detrimental, if not perilous to their livelihoods. Oh, there we go. So what is dyspepsia? Today, dyspepsia, and I'm going to put a disclaimer out there, if you're about to eat any food, the next bit might put you off, so I apologise. Um, so today, dyspepsia is defined on the National Health Service website as synonymous with indigestion. Symptoms being heartburn, feeling full and bloated, feeling sick, belching and farting, and bringing up food or bitter tasting fluids into your mouth. However, in the 19th century, whilst dyspepsia was predominantly identified as indigestion, there were varying symptoms and even different types. One medical practitioner who wrote on the intricacies of the condition was Dr. John Dewar, a graduate of the Anderson College and the University of Glasgow and senior surgeon to the Hospital for Women and Children in Vincent Square, London. He published the Red Cross Service series of health handbooks, dyspepsia, uh, in 1891, that categorised four different types. A tonic dyspepsia, described as debility of the stomach. Congestive dyspepsia, where the stomach is unusually red and congested and perhaps covered in mucus. Irritative dyspepsia, where the symptoms are not localised in the stomach, but the tongue, lungs, skin, liver or brain could also be harmed. Or nervous or neurologic dyspepsia where anxiety and an upset mind affected the stomach, stating the mind exercises its injurious influence over the body. Other medical practitioners and contemporaries use varying definitions and symptoms, meaning that advice about causes, treatments, and even how injurious dyspepsia was for the body were inconsistent. Uh, consequently, the variations in types and causes of dyspepsia meant that anyone could fall or at least believe they could fall victim to it. So as Ian Miller stated in the history of the modern stomach, gastric problems such as dyspepsia became identified as having infiltrated British society, from the working class factory worker to those fortunate to be living in a state of luxury. As dyspepsia was believed to have a variety of causes, it was associated with many different aspects of daily life, including improper diet, the wearing of corsets, and even real travel. For the most part, it is worth considering dyspepsia in the context of the railways as indigestion. However, than that, and they may have thought of dyspepsia um, as more than indigestion. So who was writing about the railways um, and public health? 
during the night the mid 19th century the railways came under scrutiny for their effects uh, on public health um, and the authors of anxious times medicine and modernity in 19th century britain show that victorian attitudes towards the railways were complex and during the 19th century new technology new technologies generated both fear and excitement with the railways being no exception there was a flurry of texts dedicated to the railways and well-being during this period, and the medical journal The Lancet held a lively debate in its issues titled The Effects of Railway Travel Upon Health, which resulted in them conducting and publishing a report titled The Influence of the Railways on Public Health in 1862, um, which could be bought for one shilling. Uh, the report discussed cases from medical professionals of illnesses around the railways, including neuralgia, railway spine and even dyspepsia. A few medical practitioners of the time discussed dyspepsia on the railways and paid particular attention to it. So in 1864, Emile de Casney, a French doctor, published a book titled Medical and Hygienic Guide for the Traveller, um, and it discussed the dangers of railway travel to the general public. A summary of the text and suggestions for railway travellers was published in many newspapers across England, from the Oxford Flying Post to the Sheffield Daily Telegraph. His opinions were that the main dangers of railway travel were colds and indigestions by hasty and immoderate meals. While whilst works from James Copland, John Dewar, em Emile de Casney and Benjamin Ward Richardson all discussed dyspepsia, by far the most extensive work on how the railways affected the health of the stomach was by Alfred Haviland and it's his pamphlet called Hurry to Death. So he's the guy on the, on the left. Um, Alfred Haviland was born in 1825. He was a medical practitioner in Bridgewater uh, in England until a near fatal accident after which he resigned from medical practice and devoted his life to research. Having wrote Hurry to Death in the hopes of advising readers in ways that they could prevent premature death, particular travel travelers who imperil their lives by thoughtful, thoughtless hurry and exertion when the stomach is full. So what do these medical writers say about dyspepsia on the railways? Despite the inconsistencies in defining dyspepsia, there seems to be an agreement of how and why travellers suffer from the condition on the railways. Havland compares railway travel to the old coaching time, which he describes as having none of that hurry and bustle that, dis that distinguishes the railways. Whereas previously coach travellers could leisurely, and if they had the means, even pick their time of travel, Railway passengers were at the mercy of the railway timetable. Furthermore, he suggests that the body became used to coach travel and any potential injuries, unlike the evils of railway travelling, where not only does the body not become accustomed to them, really serious alarm could grow worse instead of better. Therefore, as passengers try to keep up with the speed of the railway, they compromised the pace in which they led their daily lives and their stomachs suffered because of it. Most contemporaries agree on the importance of three causes of dyspepsia whilst travelling. Firstly, lack of mastication. Secondly, passengers physically overexerting their body. And thirdly, overstimulating their mind. So William Beaufort in 1840 published his results of his experiments and observations on the gastric juice and the physiology of, di of digestion. Lots of long titles in this in this paper, um, in which he stated mastication is absolutely necessary to healthy digestion. Railway travel did not promote healthy mastication. Passengers at refreshment rooms, but also at the breakfast table, were bolting down their food, not properly chewing, and making more work for their stomachs and disrupting their di their digestion. Secondly, passengers were physically exerting their body before and after eating either running to get back to their seat after a refreshment stop or running to catch the train after a meal. Haviland, for example, believed that even the effort of bending over to put on your shoes after your breakfast could hinder your digestion. Thirdly, travellers were overexerting their minds whilst eating and digesting. Practitioners believe the worry, hurry and excitement of railway travel could disturb the tranquility of their digestive processes. John Dewar stated that worry, not work, kills and killing begins in the stomach. Medical practitioners blamed both the anxiety of, ha of having to rush and hurry both to make the train or to eat a meal at the refreshment stop, but also the overstimulation from the railways themselves. 
the rapid movement, the noises and the vibration of the industrial space of the railways seemed to be at fault. The mind was seen as particularly susceptible to being overexerted and in doing so quickly hindered the stomach. Edward Harris Ruddock even suggested that when eating, habit, uh, eating breakfast, one should avoid reading the newspaper to prevent overstimulating the mind when the stomach should concentrate on eating. By overexerting both the mind and the body around mealtimes, practitioners thought the stomach could not digest properly because the body was being overworked. This suggests that the railways didn't only wreak havoc when travellers were eating around the railways, but other mealtimes as well. Both Alfred Haviland and Benjamin Ward Richardson refer to the artificial lives that Victorians were leading. They saw industrial and modern technology as unnatural, and as Ian Miller states, modernity itself constituted a threat to man's health. As a man of the urban life, uh, urban life directly challenged the intended functions of the natural body. In this case, the Victorian body could not physically keep up with the speed of the railways, and consequently the body suffered. So how serious was dyspepsia? Whilst the Lancet report and Emile de Casney both dismissed the severity of dyspepsia, Alfred Haviland, Benjamin Ward Richardson, John Dewar and Edward Ruddock saw dyspepsia as having potentially fatal consequences. John Dewar in the Red Cross Handbook gave a dramatic warning that broken laws will have their revenge and a life naturally strong and robust will be given. Haviland, Richardson and Ruddock all argued that the disruption of the stomach could have potentially fatal consequences for the heart. That by overstressing the stomach with dyspepsia, the heart in turn would also be affected and become overworked. Haviland explained to his readers that if they do not let their bodies rest properly after eating, they will be abusing their stomachs. That can cause constant irritation of the heart, which is prone to induce real cardiac disease. Furthermore, stating that once heart disease, disease is established, it cannot be fixed, and all one can do is avoid circumstances which may excite the diseased organ. He warns that to undermine the importance of rest in the body after eating results in premature disease and untimely death. However, saying this, he does stress that he believed the railways did not cause cardiac illnesses, but instead that travellers hurrying and abusing their stomach hastened and accentuated pre-existing conditions. To solidify his argument, Haviland gave a list at the end of his pamphlet of 12 people who lost their lives from hurrying on the railways. For example, in 1868, a Mr. Robert Sangster Norfield, after having refreshment at a friend's, had rushed to, the, to catch the train and within, a, and within 100 yards of the station, heaved up as if about to vomit and died. The medical evidence went to prove uh, that he had suffered from heart disease for some years and Alfred Haviland took this to support his case. So who were these texts aimed at? Uh, who was believed to be most, um, who was believed to be the biggest victim of dyspepsia at the time? So as stated earlier, anyone could become a victim, but those believed to be most at risk were businessmen and clerks. So Haviland saw clerks as the rising generation of bankers and merchants who needed to be warned of the perils of the way that they lived their lives. It was believed they used the railways daily to commute to work and in doing so risk their health from the great haste to leave in the morning and the rush in the evening for their meal. Particular commuters from Brighton who were thought to be riding to their own destruction. Um, it was believed that their irregular meals and the overexertion of their brain, the overexertion of their brain from business, business wars disrupted their stomachs. In contrast, although railway workers spent considerably more time on the railways, it was believed that they didn't face the same risks. Although it's firmly believed that railway work was a young man's game and anyone who began the profession later in life would lose their heads, it was thought that the railway servant did not succumb to the stomach ills of the railway traveller because they had a quietude of mind. Unlike the railway passenger, they were at their place of work whilst travelling, so their minds were concentrated on their surroundings, not worrying about rushing elsewhere. They could also get their meals near their work and thus rest after them. The railway worker's mind does not suffer from the hurry at and after meals. Only so it suggests it's quite interesting because I don't know 
it's one of those where um how true this would be who knows um but only minimal attention is given to women and children on the railways although Haviland believed that women were most at risk from heart disease and um, he didn't really give them much cause um the clerk was was of of more importance apparently um, but he did say that he didn't like the corset, which he questioned. Can anything be more absurd than for, pers for persons to tie themselves as tightly as possible when the stomach is empty and most compressible, and then go to a festive meeting and increase the already unnatural state of things by eating and drinking? So how do you stop yourself getting dyspepsia? The main advice from practitioners after telling patrons not to rush and eat slowly was to regulate their diet. Advice varied on what should and shouldn't be consumed. However, there are a few things that seem to be agreed on. There is one rule to be disabled to the stomach. Alcohol was a bit contentious. Some felt alcohol should be avoided altogether, while some thought a small beer was okay and helped stimulate the bowels. Others recommended wine, while spirits were thought to make mischief. And there were a few suggestions for travellers eating on the go. So sandwiches were thought to satisfy a passenger's stomach, but make no physical or mental demands upon it. Beer was meant to be avoided at all times, especially at refreshment rooms. Edward Ruddock even suggested that those already diagnosed with dyspepsia should avoid the refreshment stop. And if they were travelling, to have a basket filled with the essentials. The essentials including one chicken, one pheasant, ox tongue, a plain cake, plain biscuits, butter, grapes, wine, or wine and water. 19th century inventors and in, in, uh, entrepreneurs also took, advent, uh, also took advantage of the market for dyspepsia cures. With tonics, special food supplements such as Debari's food um, and galvanism being suggested as cures for dyspepsia. However, what I think is quite strange is that whilst cures for dyspepsia were being discussed, um, avoiding the railways was not seen uh, as a viable option. In Alfred Haviland's Hurry to Death, he uses an example of a man suffering due to railway travel and told by his physician to give up his daily commute and consequently he was rapidly restored to health. Despite illustrating this point and the potential threat of the railways on public health um, and the improvements that the body felt without rail travel, uh, rail travel, Haviland does not advise his readers to avoid using them. Instead, he recommends that travellers adjust their eating habits to fit with the railway schedule. By asking them to rise earlier in the morning and to shorten their evening to create more time for food to be consumed and digested before a commute. By recommending that passengers do this suggests how Haviland recognised that commuters saw rail travel as a permanent part of their daily lives and would potentially not adhere to being told to rest or avoid commuting. Ian Miller again stated that businessmen were liable to shun medical advice fearing that they might be told to rest. So therefore by recommending that passengers change their schedule rather than prohibiting them from rail travel shows that Haviland was pre prescribing quite a practical solution. But it also shows the imposing role that the railway had in Victorian daily lives, as eating habits were expected to be adjusted to suit the railway schedule to improve health, rather than adapting the railways. This suggests that whilst railway travellers and medical practitioners saw the railways as disrupting their routines, they, not, they did not seek to rebel against it, but sought ways to live with this new technology. So the dining car as a solution. Not only did travellers continue to use the railways, but they did turn to them as well for solutions. Returning back to the introduction of the dining car in 1879 and the resulting articles and letters to the editors that show that contemporaries believed they had experienced dyspepsia due to the railways um, disrupting their eating habits um, and also demanding the introduction of the dining car. By 1882, railway lines across Britain were introducing diner cars and breakfast cars, with a traveller on the London and Brighton line hoping that the railway company will follow the humane example of the Midland and introduce a breakfast 
breakfast car so commuters can have their morning meal in comfort. By demanding the introduction of the dining car, they were turning to the railways for a solution, seeing this as a way to eat at a leisurely pace and a regular hour. According to the London Illustrated News, a Leeds man by dining car may start from home after his usual breakfast, fortify himself with a luncheon at one o'clock, take three clear hours for his business in London, dine comfortably at six or seven o'clock and get to bed in his own house an hour before midnight. Theoretically, the dining car would allow passengers to eat at their leisure whilst traveling, rather than having to hurry to the refreshment room or rush home for dinner, hopefully preventing fits of dyspepsia. Furthermore, the dining cars were built luxuriously. And as Amy Richter suggests in Home on the Rails, George P Mortimer Pullman hopes that by decorating the dining car to reflect the civility of the domestic home, it would encourage moral behavior. However, instead, the dining car interiors became associated with customer, uh, consumer comforts. In an article about the Pullman dining cars in Britain, one commentator suggested how uh, there was an entire absence of the feeling of rapid traveling, perhaps suggesting that the dining car was seen as the solution to dyspepsia, not just because it prevented improper mastication and overexerting the body at the refreshment stop, but because it prevented overstimulation of the mind. The domestic opulent setting of the dining car in comparison to the traditionally industrial space of the railways distracted passengers from the fact that they were traveling by train and in doing so relieved them from the anxiety of the speed of the railways. Regardless of if the dining cars were a solution to dyspepsia and why they were a solution, the fact that Victorian railway travelers and commentators looked at the dining car and railways to fix their problems suggests the complex views of modern technology in the 19th century. I'm also going to point out here that um, the two images I have, are, yeah, I know are from the wrong time period, but it was more just to get an impression of what um, the dining car might look like, uh, both uh, the interior on the right hand side um, and the kind of classic Pullman um, car, car on the left hand side. So Victorians simultaneously blamed the speed of the railways for their distorted digestion, but also embraced them and the new technology as a solution to their dyspepsia. Furthermore, by looking for a solution to their dyspepsia, it suggests how Victorians acknowledged the permanence of the railways to, railway, oh, railways to their lives. They did not necessarily expect their daily routine to slow down, Instead, they look for ways in which they could adapt to it. Um, and that is me. Thank you for listening. That was a lot shorter than I intended it to be, so I apologise. Um, uh, and I hope I haven't put anyone off their dinner. Brilliant. Thank you, Chloe. Um, thanks for that. Um, we'll give you kind of a virtual clap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to um, stop the recording now so we can um, move on to the questions.